Sorry, point of order, Bruce Crawford. Uh, President Officer, under Rule 73, uh, which says that members shall at all times conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner, I seek your guidance on, on what in future will be considered to be acceptable parliamentary language and behaviour in this chamber. President Officer, can you tell me whether we are on the slippery slope with regard to the respect that members show to each other in this chamber while addressing other members? For instance, over the past couple of weeks, we've heard terms like, and I hesitate to repeat the words out of respect, Patrick Harvey, but the term Patsy Harvey was used by Murdo Fraser a couple of times when addressing a fellow member. Sign officer in future, will it be appropriate to address me, for instance, as Crafty Crawford? Or perhaps even, and forgive me for using this language, but I do so in order to make a point, Crappy Crawford? Presiding officer, are we on a slippery slope where the names are used, whether they're positive or negative in nature? And should we not demonstrate appropriate parliamentary respect through the use of proper name terms, be that Murdo Fraser, Bruce Crawford, or indeed Patrick Harvey? President officer, your guidance would be most appreciated. You need to know what is deemed to be acceptable and unacceptable behaviour in this regard and where the line is to be drawn. President officer, I think you know my views in this regard. Thank you, Mr Crawford. Thank you, Mr Crawford, and uh, thank you also for alerting me to your concerns about this matter. Um, I would first of all reiterate that uh, it's up to all of us to treat all members with the respect they are due, uh, and that includes uh, addressing members by their proper names. Uh, I also believe the specific incident to which you refer, the presiding officer in the chair at the time, the second time it was used, did intervene appropriately at the time. So I hope Mr Crawford is assured by that matter that we take these matters very seriously indeed. And I move on to the next item of business, topical questions. And we start with topical question number one from Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I suspect I shouldn't uh, try any jokes on names uh, after that uh, point of order. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that almost half of head teachers consider there is a lack of teaching staff in schools. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is taking a number of actions to help recruit and retain teachers. We are spending £88 million this year to make sure every school has access to the right number of teachers. We are opening up new and innovative routes into teaching. We have increased student in teacher intake targets for the fifth year in a row, and we are setting targets to train teachers in the subjects where they are needed most. I will also be launching a new teacher recruitment campaign tomorrow. This builds on the success of last year's Inspiring Teachers campaign, which helped drive a 19% increase in PGDE applications to Scottish universities compared to the previous year. We have also gone further than our manifesto commitment by providing £120 million of pupil equity funding for 2017-18. This funding will be available for head teachers for use for the additional resources that they consider will help raise attainment and reduce the poverty-related attainment gap. This funding has been allocated directly to head teachers as they and other school leaders are best placed to know the needs of the children and young people in their school. Tavish Scott. Grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. In 2007, the Scottish Government said we will reduce class sizes in primary one, two and three to 18 pupils or less. Four years later, they said there will be a new legal limit on t of 25 on class sizes in primary one. Last year, they did not mention class sizes at all. Today, only one in 10 primary one to primary three classes have 18 pupils or less. Yet there are 2,000 fewer teachers, but 20,000 more pupils. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that head teachers are telling him the number of children in a class matters? And what's he going to do about it? Cabinet Secretary. Um, yeah, of course I accept that point and what the government is trying to do is to ensure that we have the adequate number of teachers in our schools. As Mr Scott will be aware, the number of teachers in our schools rose last year. Um, that uh, was a consequence of the decisions the government had taken to apply resources and to apply constraints on local authorities in relation to the, um, the number of teachers that were required in our schools. And we believe it is important because of our commitment, again reinforced in the local government settlement this year, um, to protect the pupil-teacher ratio, uh, which of course is a direct relationship between the number of teachers and the number of pupils. So yes, of course, I acknowledge that is important. 
and the government is taking a series of actions to address this issue uh, and to ensure that we have an adequate supply of teachers uh, that are able to lead our education system in Scotland. Tavis Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. But from August this year, Presiding Officer, there will be more than 400,000 primary school teachers in Scotland. Nearly a quarter, 86,000, have additional support needs. Across Scotland's 2,000 primary schools, there are only 193 additional support teachers. As schools now face further budget cuts, how are class teachers meant to cope with that reality? I'm going to say, you. Uh, the first thing is to say to Mr Scott is that I'm sure he is aware that the definition of um, young people with additional support needs was significantly broadened in 2010, which accounts to, to, to a much broader scale of attention to ensure that even um, the, um, the, the more limited issues of additional needs that a young person might have, even of a temporary nature, are adequately and fully taken into account by the teaching profession. Uh, so that's the first point to put the increase in the, the number of pupils with additional support needs into context. The second point is to say that the number of, um, of, of professionals who are working with children with additional support needs rose last year, as did the amount of money spent by local authorities on this area of activity. The rise was uh, of the order of £24 million, if my memory serves me correct. And then thirdly, in relation to the budget that was approved by Parliament um, at the Stage 1 proceedings last Thursday, there is a significant increase in the resources that will be available to local authorities as a consequence of the Government's budget. Um, £160 million of additional resources were put into the Local Authority Block Grant, which adds to the increase in spending power of local authorities or in local authority services. Um, of £240 million as a consequence of the Government's budget. Now, I know Mr Scott and his colleagues were unable to support the budget last week. It defies belief that they were unable to support the budget last week because it represents significant investment in our local authority services and I think it would be welcome if Mr Scott could provide some support to that effort to ensure that the schools of Scotland are given the resources that they require, including £120 million of pupil equity funding that will be influencing the performance of 95% of schools across Scotland. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary knows that from this side of the Chamber we believe that two things could help ease teacher shortages. Firstly, ensuring that there is a national register of supply teachers which would allow councils to hire staff with much greater flexibility than is currently the case. And secondly, to relax some of the rules around pensions abatement which would tempt more of those in retirement age to find it easier to re-enter the profession. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary what progress has been made on these two practical steps? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I, I certainly... On, on the issue of the register of supply teachers, I, I'm, I, I'm afraid I, I, I'm sceptical about whether that would make much of a difference because the challenge is about actually having supply teachers available. And uh, schools are, schools are uh, well, <laughs> you know, we, we, we can't register supply teachers that are not available. And uh, so schools are habitually um, looking for uh, supply teachers to fill gaps which uh, arise out of um, vacancies and out of temporary absence of schools. Um, and I don't doubt that there is a huge amount of effort put in by schools to ensure that the supply needs are met. In relation to the question on pensions abatement, I'll, I'll have a look at that particular issue to determine if there is something that can be done in that respect. But it's important. Um, uh, I have to be mindful of the importance of assessing issues of value for money in relation to all financial arrangements that are put in place in relation to uh, the teaching profession. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The same survey result didn't just highlight teachers, it highlighted supporting staff and indeed classroom materials. Is the reality not that this highlights the impact of the 1.4 billion decline in revenue funding to local governments since 2010? And while the Cabinet Secretary mentions extra money. The reality is, is that that is a one, 170 million net decline, even after the additional funding that he mentions, which is a cut, not an increase. Does that not reflect the reality of resourcing in education? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, there's an increase in spending power in local, in local authority services before the stage one proceedings last Thursday of £240 million. And we added another £160 million of that uh, to that figure. 
And we have also, uh, within that number, we have targeted £120 million of pupil equity funding directly into the schools of Scotland. So, no, I do not recognise the picture of funding that Mr Johnson talks about. And one of the things that would help, one of the things that would help to improve the recruitment of teachers if members of parliament, like Mr Johnson, were slightly more positive about Scottish education yeah, yeah, than the yeah. dismal diatribe yeah. that we hear yeah. from him every dismal. single time dismal. he speaks in this chamber on education. He contributes to undermining the quality yeah. and strength of Scottish yes, education, and he should up his game. Yeah, yeah. Up his game. Question number two, Polly McNeill. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to reduce the amount of time families are spending in emergency accommodation. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, people may be in emergency accommodation such as B&Bs if they have to leave their home quickly, uh, for example because of fire or domestic abuse. Households with children and pregnant women are covered by the unsuitable accommodation order, which ensures that this is only for a short period of time. Uh, we are committed to introducing a cap of one week for families with children and pregnant women living in B&B &B accommodation, unless there are exceptional circumstances. Scotland's strong homelessness rights means that families are placed in temporary accommodation while they wait for appropriate sustainable permanent accommodation. Polly McNeill. Presiding officer, let me begin by uh, welcoming the government statement on the cap of one week on bed and breakfast accommodation. But is the minister aware uh, that Shelter, in an article this week, has said that the time that families have spent in temporary accommodation has risen by one fifth in two years? The minister well knows that children are adversely affected by living in temporary accommodation. But since last year, there are 826 more children living in temporary accommodation. Does the Minister firstly agree that those are the correct figures and if not, uh, at some point I, I, I would hope that he would indicate to me what the figures that he would accept are and also uh, what is the Minister doing to establish the factors and the reasons for any rise in these figures? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, as uh, Shelter have pointed out, Temporary accommodation is a necessary part uh, of our strong homelessness <laughs> legislation uh, and ensures that families have a home if made homeless. Uh, time spent in temporary accommodation should be best used to posit positively identify the best possible housing option for a household to ensure a better outcome. Uh, we want time and temporary accommodation to be as short as possible uh, and we are increasing housing supply uh, to help with this. Uh, temporary accommodation in Scotland is generally of uh, good quality and is normally in the social rented sector. Uh, we have strengthened the unsuitable accommodation order which regulates the quality of temporary accommodation for households with children and pregnant women uh, and we have plans to strengthen this further. Uh, this order also addresses the issue of proximity to health and education services. Uh, we are working with local authorities and partners uh, to improve the use of temporary accommodation for homeless households. Uh, I wrote to Ms McNeill last month to offer to meet her on homelessness issues. Uh, and can I say that that offer still stands? Polly McNeill. Presiding officer, um, I thank the minister for his offer and I'll take him up on that. But I have to ask again, does the minister accept that there has been a rise in the number of children and a rise in the length of time that families are spending in temporary accommodation? Uh, further to that, um, does the minister agree that it would be helpful if the Scottish Government were to agree minimum standards for temporary and emergency accommodation, uh, particularly since the uh, welfare benefit cap could affect the quality of housing that families are living in to ensure that they have decent, affordable accommodation. Minister. Uh, we have done everything possible, uh, President Officer, to ensure that temporary <laughs> accommodation uh, is the right accommodation. And that's why 86% of the temporary accommodation uh, that is being used in Scotland at this moment is in the social housing sector. Uh, increasing uh, the affordable housing uh, in Scotland uh, by 50,000 units uh, is one of the key planks of government policy. 35,000 of those uh, for social rent. Uh, 
Uh, and that in itself uh, will help uh, in these particular areas. Um, households in temporary accommodation uh, have decreased uh, from this by 1% uh, from the same date last year. It is unfortunate uh, that the number of children uh, in, uh, in households in temporary accommodation has increased compared to one year ago. Uh, and as I pointed out in my previous answer, uh, we will do everything possible uh, to ensure uh, that their time in temporary accommodation is as short as possible. As I said, that this, this period gives us the option uh, to find the right housing uh, for these folks uh, while they're in that accommodation. Uh, and as I previously said as well, uh, presiding officer, uh, we will put in a cap of one week for families with children uh, and pregnant women living in B&B accommodation. Uh, and I'm glad that Ms McNeill welcomes that. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in their um, report on homelessness uh, in Scotland, Shelter Scotland in September of last year reported that in England, the Ministerial Working Group on Preventing and Tackling Homelessness has brought together eight different government departments to produce a series of what Shelter describe as major strategic documents that have been significant in progressing the approach to preventing and tackling homelessness in England and have led to a number of uh, important innovations such as joint funding initiatives um, and shelter give some uh, examples and they then say this that far more must be done to ensure that similar joined up working with multiple strategic partners is achieved in Scotland does the minister agree presiding officer the homelessness prevention and strategy group uh, of which shelter is a member uh, meets to look strategically at homelessness uh, across Scotland uh, and any member of that group can raise any issue uh, and we can try and find solutions to any issues that are raised. Uh, in terms of cross-government working, uh, I've met with colleagues over uh, the past number of weeks, the Minister for Social Security, uh, the Minister for Mental Health uh, and the Minister for Children in Early Years uh, to look at how we can better join up our approach to homelessness in Scotland. I intend to have these bilateral meetings uh, with other colleagues, uh, present findings to the strategy group that I have mentioned, uh, and hopefully by working in partnership uh, with our stakeholders and by ensuring that there is a cross-government uh, response, uh, we can do even better uh, for homeless people in Scotland. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. Point of order, Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I rise to make a point of order regarding reports that today the government's independent poverty adviser uh, removed criticism of government cuts to councils from the final draft of her report on tackling poverty. In the earlier drafts, as reported today, before the government suggested change, Naomi Eisenstadt said that the cuts to council services would hit the poorest the hardest. Can you, presiding officer, confirm that these questions raised today will be addressed in a ministerial statement before the end of the budget process? Thank you, Mr. Early. I don't believe that's a point of order, but it is a, a, an important point you've raised, which I'm sure the government will have heard and will consider in due course. Point, uh, of, the oh, uh, point of order, Neil Findlay. Under Rule 8.12, I intend moving a, mo a motion without notice. So, President Officer, under Rule 8.1.4, I move a motion without notice to extend this debate by up to 30 minutes. This will allow ad additional debating time so that members who have indicated to you that they want to speak in this debate but have been denied a speaking slot by their party managers and whips can have the opportunity can have the opportunity to speak in this debate, subject, of course, to being called by you. This happens regularly in members' business. Regularly in members' business, and in the interest of democracy, I would urge you to accept this request. Uh, thank you, Mr. Findlay. Uh, that, that is a point of order. The members raising a, a point for me to consider. Um, just for information, Mr. Findlay, it's, although business managers may recommend speakers, it's for the presiding officer to choose which speakers to select and presiding officers will choose speakers to reflect a range of views across the chamber. Uh, in this instance, the, the, the Bureau made a recommendation and set aside the whole of this afternoon for today's business uh, and Parliament voted and agreed that that was sufficient time. If 
um, we haven't even started the debate yet. If members feel and the debate is overcrowded and there's not sufficient time later on, uh, it's up to any member to move uh, such a motion. But at the moment, I will not consider the motion for a vote. Further point of order from Mr Finlay. Position, I would like it put to a vote. If you, Sorry, I, would, I have moved that position and I would like that put to parliament, a vote of parliament. Yeah, yes, you've made a suggestion. It's up to the presiding officer to decide whether or not to take it or not. And in this case, I'm not going to take it. So we're not going to have a vote on it. Uh, so we will now...